Ladies and gentlemen, if you're ready, let's uh, hear it for Purpal Singh. Uh, Purpal! Okay, so you can hear me? You can hear me now? Okay, good. So, um, it's, it's not nice going up stage after a rock performer. <laughs> but this is where I belong. I've been doing this for about 25 years. I take my job very seriously. If it's a five minute talk or it's a one hour, I take it as though my life depends on it. I hope I can do justice to this group today. So first of all, uh, I'm gonna get very intimate with you guys. So I'm gonna start off by sharing a little things about me which are the most important thing in my life. So here you go. First of all, my name is Perth Pal. I was not born in Australia, but hell, I got that name. <laughs> <laughs> all right? Uh, well, that's not how you pronounce the name, actually. It's supposed to be Prithpal. Prith means world, Pal means care. My father had this dream that I'm going to take care of the goddamn world. <laughs> a little bit too much, really. I'm disappointing him, definitely. Uh, most of my friends call me Pal, so just call me Pal. You don't have to call me Mister. I know I'm a man. I don't need validation. <laughs> All right? But apart from that, uh, central to what I do, I'm a father. That is the most important thing in my life. Everything else pales in comparison. I take this very seriously. So let me tell you a bit about me. Well, for the past 10 years, I've been trying to be 44 years old. Uh, <laughs> let's go statistic. Uh, well, let's go a bit more detail. Height, 183 centimeters, weight, 79 kilos. Let's go a bit more detail. Body fat percentage. Used to be about 13.8, it's about 20.5 percent. Everything I do, there's a reason, suspend your judgment, just go along with me. Uh, let's go a bit more detail. Resting heart rate still pretty good, 56 beats per minute. I come from a family of runners. I run quite a lot. I sometimes run away from responsibilities too. <laughs> I really do, I really do. Uh, my kids, uh, that's my daughter. I, I make beautiful babies, okay? <laughs> Prata means prayer. Uh, but that, she's 16 years old now. <laughs> but honest to God, I love her better when she was four. <laughs> really? When they are four years old, Papa is a superhero, isn't it? <laughs> and they just 18, 19, hormones start playing ping pong with their brains, they start saying the world very differently. It's her birthday today. Oh. 19 years old, goddamn, she's in Italy. <laughs> At the age of 14, she had a full scholarship. She flew off to Bahamas, studied in a private international school, wow. right now in Wales. She's a go-getter. She's amazing. She's just like me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my son, the biggest eyes in the world. Oh, he's 18 years old now, he's in IMU. You know, I, I feel sometimes the doctor must have stopped dropping on his head when he was born. Let me tell you why. My entire family is a hardcore supporter of the best football club in the world. Oh. <laughs> Liverpool. Yeah. And if you don't agree with me, all right? But my son is a hardcore supporter of Manchester United. <laughs> so what do I do? I buy him his memorabilia, his jerseys, you know, when Manchester United wins, which is very rarely. <laughs> I do applaud and, you know, dance with him. Why? Because I think if I spend enough time with him, I'll be able to take him to the right path, leave him. Because <laughs> sometimes you have to dance with people before you can take them to where you want them to go. Right? But I'm, I'm contented. It's okay for him to be a loser because he charges your path, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, in 2014, somewhere in July, it was a Tuesday, my wife and I was having coffee in Coffee Bean opposite uh, KPJ Hospital in Ampang Putri. Uh, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a message came in the phone and the message says, hey guys, there's a lady, foreigner, who was stayed in this country, uh, she's full prep. She's full term, she's going to deliver in two days' time. She's an illegal status and she doesn't want the baby. Anybody interested? I look at the message. I told my wife, hey, baby for adoption, one. And she goes, okay. <laughs> I said, okay. She said, okay. I said, okay. And then I press okay. And then I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> because at that time, my children were 9 and 11. When your children are 9 and 11, it's on auto cruise, right? They pack their own bags, they mind their own business. Life is good. Are you going to bring a baby to the house? And I got only 
in two days before the baby, baby arrives. So I had two days. So what I had to go and do was go to mother care in KLCC and shop for every damn thing. I don't even know what I need. I have to Google a list of what a newborn needs. And I have to buy all neutral colors because I don't even know whether it's a boy or a girl. Imagine buying pink and the boy comes. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> bye. I'm very pink. Doctor, doctor. Okay, yeah. Uh, so two days later, oh, just to let you know, the reason that I did that, because my father said a KPI on all, this, on, the, on the children. He said, once your life is good, you need to sponsor a child outside of the relation, outside of the race and outside of the religion. It cannot be from our own clan. It must be from the outside. So all my siblings done it except for me. But let me tell you, adopting a child and sponsoring a child are two very different things. <laughs> right? So I went to the hospital to pick the child up. And how wrong and how arrogant I was thinking that I can give the child a better life because the day I had Umid in my arms, I really she was giving me more than I can ever imagine. It's a very humbling experience to fall in love with someone that you have never met in your life. The name Moe is a Sufi Islamic name, which means yearning, expectation. I gave that name to her. She's a, the, the journey of adopting her was a very difficult one because she's stateless, you know, and but I did the right thing. I wanted to raise the child based on truth. So I took the biological mother, registered her under the mother's name, got a birth certificate, and then start the process of adoption and Eventually, we got the papers done. Uh, I got the birth certificate with my name on it, but it was still pink because she is my child, but she's not a Malaysian citizen. They have to apply for the citizenship. It doesn't take long. It's about 8 to 15 years only. <laughs> but along the way, I also know some very, very good people. Wahid Omar is a good friend of mine. He wrote a letter, and I was called for an interview. Right now, Umi is 8 years old, kicking ass international school, and she is a Malaysian citizen already. Yeah. So, right, so, so, so uh, that's her now, I mean, she's half Filipino, half Punjabi. That makes her a Jabino, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, that's the children, right? Look at the Manchester United jersey. <laughs> right, hold on, hey, who, where's the wife? Well, okay, so just to clarify. <laughs> No, she is not. Uh, she is. She is. Uh, right. Yeah, all right. Anyway, so I do a bit of running, um, and I I cycle. I I I play tabla. Been doing that for 28 years. Not the best tabla player in the world, but I can be. But really, the ambition was to be a professional dancer. I kid you not. But try telling that to a Punjabi father, first generation from India. You know what's his reaction? You want to be what? <laughs> you think I left Punjab for you to be a dancer? You being a doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? So what do I do right now? I basically run a consulting company called Learning Edge. I've been doing this for about 25 years now. So the question is, how I got started? So here's my journey. I must tell you this. I, I was very privileged. I came from a from a nice family, super. I got a father who is a amazing guy and a mother who is the softest and the nicest person in the world. I guess you will tell that about your parents as well. Uh, but I do not know your parents, so I'm going to talk about my parents, all right? <laughs> so, so my father used to tell me this, he said, you better study hard. If you don't study hard, you're not going to make it. You better study hard. You can become like him. Like him. There's a picture of a guy in our house. I do not even know who the hell he was. <laughs> Until I was seven years old, I discovered that he was too poor Brahman. I'm looking like, I don't want to be like him. He's got a stubby nose. He doesn't look like us. But it was my way, father's way of saying what success is all about, to do better. So I, so everybody in the family was told that education is important. So my sister went to the university. And then my brother went to uh, UTM in 1980s to do architecture. It's, a, it's an expensive school. And so dad was deciding, should he go or not? Because my father could not afford to pay for the fees. So we all decided, like, hey, you know what? Probably he should go to university. And that's when we decided to chip in in the family's uh, kitty. So I started off my, my job as a uh, fuel transfer engineer, basically a, a petrol pump attendant, actually. <laughs> <laughs> At the age of 13. And I'm not saying this as a part-time job. 
It's a full-time job. And uh, I used to work in British Petroleum, uh, BP's oil station. Work starts at 4.30 in the afternoon until about 9.30 at night. And then we go back home, have dinner, and we come back and sleep in the petrol station until next day, 6.30. Then we run the petrol pump until 7.30 to pass on to the bosses in the morning, and then we go to school. So I used to go to school late every year. Now, when I tell you this, it's not that, oh, look, our life was difficult. No, it was not. Because you do not know the difference. That's the car that's dealt to you. For us, that's the way we roll. So I'm not going to say that, oh, life was difficult. No, I came from a bloody privileged family because I got a crazy, damn good father who never made us feel any less. So that's how I started. I had scholarship. I went to the same university that Mui Han went to and uh, bumped around there for five years. I had a full scholarship. And I didn't find university really exciting. Lectures were boring. <laughs> They were not like professional speakers. <laughs> <laughs> they were reading from transparencies, and then thinking I can get more information going to the library. So that's where I spend most of my time. I skip classes. I must tell you that I'm not a great model. But I had a girl, great girlfriend who actually had great notes. <laughs> <laughs> so I read my notes. I do better than her. She dumped me. <laughs> what do I say? Next. <laughs> So there's a book that I picked up in the university and made a lot of difference to me. I picked up the book somewhere in 1989, three years after the book, the book was published. I didn't know that the book is going to be such a big thing. And there's one page in that book, I still remember a line that says, the future belongs to those people who have got specialized knowledge and the ability to communicate it. And the book was unlimited power. It was three years after it was published. In 86, I picked up the book in 89. I thought, okay, specialized knowledge and ability to communicate it. So I need to learn a little bit more. I started going to the classes from then on the last two years. Now, graduated, and then what I did was I decided to work in this company called ST Microelectronics, hardcore manufacturing environment. While I was studying there, while I was working there, I continued my studies in Kuala Lumpur, did some other diploma programs. I, I worked really, really hard. And uh, you know, and working as the while the work was difficult, but you work with six thousand females. <laughs> but get rich environment, my friend. I was young, so I, it was it was really good in that sense, right? And because of my extra qualification, I was trained by Dr. Peter Shepard, who was a powerful mentor for me, and he guided me a little bit, and that led me to a position in Cellcom when Cellcom started way back in 1991, 1992. And along came a request from the CEO to say, Paul, look for a speaker who can talk to me about coaching. I picked up the phone and called this dude by the name of Dr. Palan, <laughs> who is stands me now. And I said, Dr. Palan, hey, um, my name is Paul Spal. You need to come in and talk for about an hour to the coach, uh, to, the, to the senior leader. He said, OK, I can do that. Not exactly his slang. <laughs> he came and he delivered the speech, and then he invoiced for that one hour, 2,000 ringgit, 1991. I'm looking, bloody hell, that kind of work? 2,000 ringgit? I can do that too. <laughs> right? So, so I started preparing payment for a lot of trainers, and some of them were not that great. Dr. Pollen is good, by the way. So I thought, mm, I think I can do this too. So what happened was, when you read too many books, uh, the books tell you, you can do anything in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I start believing that shit. <laughs> I was the youngest head of department in Cellcom at the age of 26. I was rising up. I tend up my resignation and say, I'm a consultant now. Hire me. In 1997, <laughs> during the world, worst economic crisis, was one of the most stupidest things I've done. <laughs> Looking back, I could have done it better. Yeah. I could have learned from some people, get a mentor. So <coughs> I went out and uh, started telling people, hey, I can change your organization. <laughs> My beard was all black. <laughs> I had to 
die, why to look nice? <laughs> so this is not gonna change, man. This is asset, all right? So, anyway. So I started running my organization, and, and what seems to be like random events that I've just mentioned, I did this, I did that, actually it's not really that random. If some of you have seen this activity I used to do before, I've got no time to waste on this activity, I'm just gonna explain what it is all about. Random word, random letters, you need to trace the numbers from number one all the way to number 50, and you're given one minute, and at the end of the one minute, chances are some people will get anything between 14 to number 24. If you're number 27 or 28, you're a liar. <laughs> right. and, and what seems to be like random actually may not be that random. You know why? Because all the numbers are distributed in nine boxes. And there you go. Number one is there, <coughs> number two, number three, number four, number five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then it goes all the way 10, and then follow 11, 12. So if you stand to able to the see the pattern, you're able to decipher and make lesser mistakes, but mistakes you must make anyway. You can make better quality mistakes instead of making same goddamn stupid mistakes, right? So, so moving on. Hopefully moves. Good. So if some of you have picked up this book, Range, by David Epstein. He talks about why the journalists triumph in a specialized world. The book talks about that in the future, those people who are gonna, gonna do really, really well, it's not those people who have accumulated number of years, but rather what you have put into the years. The skill set, the half-life of knowledge and skills are getting shorter. What may be relevant when you graduated, could have taken you for 15, 16 years up to now, or whatever you know now, the half-life of it is getting shorter. So he talks about the difference between Tiger Wood and Federer, if some of you have come across that work. That Tiger Wood works in a very, very kind environment. You, your board, your skill set in a fair way with nice people all around. Federer, on the other hand, is in a very wicked environment. You're playing tennis against an opponent. How we return, you have to deal with that. And then boisterous crowd around you that can also cause a lot of anxiety. How you deal with that? In the future, is the world going to be kind or is it going to be wicked? wicked. It's going to be wicked. So in a, in a wicked environment, you need to be able to have different sets of skill set for you to navigate in this situation. So if you, if you know, if some of you have come across this, experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. Let me explain to you what I mean by this, or what Adam Huxley meant when he wrote this. Uh, I was coming back from Sabah for business, reached KLIA, <coughs> took a cab back home to Ampang, where I live. Sat in the cab, he was a Malay guy with Kapia, and I speak kick ass Basa Malaysia, by the way. My Basa Malaysia is to die for. Asa rasa parik penorogo tangkak juho, cakap jawa pun boleh. Yang main-main ya. Dari, jauh kamu. Anyway, so I immediately start a conversation with him. I said, hey, apa khabar? I said, khabar baik. That means I'm good. I said, oh, dah lama naik bawa kereta taxi. Have you been driving long? I said, oh, dah lama. Saya pengalaman pun banyak. Oh, I said, yeah, girl. He said, I've got so much of experience. He said, saya accident pun dah 14 kali. I'm like, okay, hold on. Is today going to be my lucky 15? Is that experience or is that stupidity? He's wearing all his tailors like medals. Look, accident, Jalan Nampang, 1947. <laughs> Look, another one, Jalan Sutra, Maya, 1968. <laughs> this is not experience, it's what you do with what happens to you. <coughs> Look, my father never liked his job. My father was a watchman in OCBC Bank Tangka Johor. Stood in the same spot, with the same double barrel, never took a shot. We thank God he never had to. <laughs> But although he did not like his job, let me tell you, his mustache would be handlebar, his shirt would be starched. He will stand in that position. You know why? He said, they're not paying me any less. Why am I giving them any less on my part? If you talk about professionalism, I think he epitomized that behavior. So, and, and, and when I say, wow, wow, you know, 
so, so he, he set a goal in his life. He did not want to retire. He wanted to resign. He wanted to beat the job before the job beats him. In his own way, it's like the job. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So he did that at the age of 51. He tended and said, wow, pa, not bad, pa. 30 years, you must have really loved your job. What stupid job that was. <laughs> I said, but, but you stood in the same floor. He said, yeah, it's because of you. I mean, I, I didn't ask you to make me. <laughs> not my problem. Of course, I didn't say that to him, right? I said, but Peter, you, uh, you know, Father, I mean, you went to job every day. You really look good. He said, Peter, listen, sometimes, sometimes, Peter, a boy meets a girl. They fall in love, and they get married like a sister. He said, Peter, sometimes some people also get married first and then fall in love. He said, love is not a criteria for marriage. The Caucasians cannot process that, by the way. <laughs> okay? You know what? My father never met my mother until the day they got married. My father was brought in my, you know, to this place, and my mother was all packed up, DHL, super packaged. <laughs> and they took the wow, and then after four rounds, he unveiled my mother and saw my mother for the first time, and I got, I guess he struck big time lottery. Because <laughs> my mother is really beautiful. My father, uh, <laughs> my father is a tall, dark, Punjabi guy, right? <laughs> I always tell him he overmarried, actually. <laughs> but you know what? They slept on the same bed. They had five kids. They had 14 grandchildren. They slept on the same bed until two and a half years ago when my mother passed away. I guess they did fall in love. Now, so my father actually tells me that, you know, if you find a job next time, better, uh, you know, work in, a, work in a restaurant if you have to. Learn how to wash the plates, and then probably you can learn how to use the cash register. After a while, you can learn how to cook, and, and then maybe one day you can become a business owner. Now, so having that range is very, very important. You know, some people say you need to love what you do. I know Scott said that yesterday. He echoed that. Um, I wrote a book. By the way, I wrote a book. It's at the back. Uh, <laughs> and I said, you really don't have to learn your job to do your job well. I really don't. I mean. Okay, here, here you go. This is a very specialized book. How many of you are really living your dreams right now? This is what you always wanted to do from the day, from get-go in your life. How many of you are living it? Right. Good. For those who are not, it's okay. It's okay too. It doesn't really matter. Because you can fall in love with something else that comes along the way. How do you know what you really, really love? I think you have to do stuff and try stuff. I mean, you sold shirts. You sold clothes, man. Right? You should show that, and how do you know? If that's not it, you have to try a different thing. I think people have to do stuff and try stuff. Now, so, so you can be smart by following a certain pattern, right? We're gonna expose ourselves to a lot of things, and the pattern is simply this, books that you read and people that you meet. We have been talking about this for many, many years, that you can acquire knowledge by the books that you read and also people that you meet. This is a great place for us to meet people and learn from each other. You can shorten the period of uh, taken to learn a certain set of skill. Now, so how do we learn? Typically, we learn from experience, we learn from examples, and we also learn from formal education setting. So this is a combination of all three in this group. From these three ways of learning, which is the most powerful way of learning? Experience, experience but you need to, then you come for formal education to validate whatever experiences that you have, okay? now. Now, once you've acquired all this, right, so, and, and you think, I need, to, I need to accumulate, I need to accumulate, but there's something called the aggregation of marginal gains. All you need to focus is to keep on becoming better little by little every day. And the aggregation of marginal gains simply says this, if this is where you are right now, your status quo, if you just do improvement 1% every day, mathematically, 1% improvement over 365 days will make you about 38 times better. So it's about you are picking up a certain quotation, practicing it, a certain uh, intonation that you use, storytelling style, so many things that you're learning in this workshop today. If you just take that and keep on doing that little by little, amazing things can be achieved. Now, I just want to demonstrate to you a little bit about this concept of uh, aggregation of marginal gains. I play tabla. I'm not Zakir Hussein. I sometimes <laughs> pretend to be one. Uh, do we have a microphone here? Do we have? So 
So let me explain to you why about 95% of people who start learning a certain musical instrument will give up. Let me tell you why. So. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen? It's been quite some time since some people have seen the Kutikura, isn't it? Yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. So what you need to do when you learn the tabla, the first month probably you have to repeat the same note. There, there are a couple of notes like ta and ti. So ta is ta and ti is ta, ti, te, te, right? So the first month, all you do is That's what you do. That's what you do. And a lot of people don't find that sexy. <laughs> so a lot of people give up. So you have to go through the initial stage of boredom. Then you learn a note. Da, tin, tak, din. That's it. Four beat. Then you have da, tin, tak, tin, tak, tin, tak, tin, tak, tin. Okay? And then you say you need to learn this is another piece. Then they start teaching you a bit more complex playing. It could be a 16 B classical B. It goes something like so that's how it goes. Right? That's the beat, right? Six, sixteen beat. Now, if you go and bring in that into this, then you can start. That's a ra. That's a classical. Right? But the one that will move everybody is something music that can get you into a beat. The hit machine. <laughs> now, this one came after about 13 months, 14 months. But the 12 months was shitty. It was really, really shitty. The aggregation of marginal gain simply tell you mathematically, if you just improve that little bit, so focus on that one or two things, and you will be improving tremendously. Now, now if you do anything less, if you just decline by 1% every day, you will be almost zero by the end of this process. Now, next, now that you know all this, what do you need to do? You need to get off your ass, man. You know enough already. You know, there's a story about this king who received two beautiful falcons, and he gave the falcons to his falconer and said, I want you to train them. After about a week of training, really that fast? Uh, okay, this is the deal. I'm gonna keep on talking. If you think it's worthy, stay or else go. But let me tell you, if you go, I have over the years a quiet set of skills. <laughs> skills that will make nightmare for people like you. I will find you. <laughs> I will. All right? So, anyway, so you can win one you one, but today I'm just going to go. So get off your ass. So, after about a week, one falcon started flying and the other falcon did not move from the branch. So he asked all his court uh, officials to say, you know, let's have a, 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 a open competition and see whether people can help it fly. So people tried, it did not fly. And after a few weeks, some people resigned to the fact that probably this falcon cannot fly. Until one evening, one farmer went in there and asked the guard, hey, is this competition still open? He said, yeah. He said, can I try? He said, yeah, you can go in. He went in there, finally said, he came out and said, it's done, it's flying. So next thing the king saw that the falcon was flying. He says, call the old man. I need to know the secret. He said, ask the old man, what happened? How did you do it? It's a very simple, I just went in there, cut off the branch. He just cut off the branch. <laughs> Sometimes you need to get off your branches, mate. You are a bit too, comf too comfortable. So all you need to do is just start, right? Now, when you start, you have a very sophisticated way to give you an illusion that you are starting, but actually you are procrastinating. There's something called action taking. 
action faking something that I got into. <laughs> Those people who wrote the book, you know how you action fake, right? You know how I action fake? Oh, I need to have a special room. I got the room. <laughs> it must be 22 degrees Celsius. I got that done. I had a table which is slightly tilted because I need to write with my hand. I will not type, not sexy enough. I need to use a pencil. And pencil cannot be mechanical. It must be 2B, stapler. <laughs> and it has to be sharp. Yeah. It has to be sharp. And in order for it to be sharp, I need 24 of them. But to keep 24 pencils sharp, you need a sharpener. You can't use them. No, you need to use the electric one. I got that too. I got the chair done. It should be rolling because I need to go reach for the water. <laughs> but it cannot roll too far, so I need to have a carpet. Carpet done. I got a carpet. I got the pencils, I got the water, I got the do not disturb me sign, I got the room temperature done, light, cool white, cannot be the warm white. It has to be cool white. I got that done. Tapi tulis tidak juga. I did not write. It's like you setting a goal, losing the five kilos, isn't it? What do you need? You need that clothing, then you need to have the Adidas hijab. It cannot be Tudung Hadija. It cannot be the duck. I know to don't, but I keep the to faham lah kan? Anyway, so, so you got the Adidas thing and then you must have Fitbit because you need to collect data. It has to be scientific, isn't it? You got that, you know, 24 wild shoes on, you got that sweat dispensing uh, stockings on, you got all that, but rhyming, not yet. That is what you call action taking, instead of action taking. Now, and once you start, right, don't, re don't worry about knowing everything. It's amazing what one can achieve when one doesn't know what one can do. Yeah. Jim Davis talked about this in, his, in, in this cartoon strip called, uh, Jim Davis wrote Garfield. So tell me, what's wrong with this picture? Here's Garfield looking up a tree, and on the tree is a Odie. Odie's on the tree, and Garfield's looking up a tree. What's wrong with that picture? Sabir, yeah, that's right. Because dogs are not supposed to climb trees. But Odie was so stupid that he doesn't know that dogs cannot climb the tree, that he climbed the goddamn tree. So it's amazing what one can achieve when one doesn't know what one can do. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. You don't have to know too much. So talking to too many people to try to get everything right is not going to make you become a speaker. So I hope. That, that level of uncertainty should always be there. It, it, it creates that kind of interesting journey for your own. Now, and, and once you start, you're going to go through this process called desert of desertion. It's when you have put in everything. You have done all the brochures, you have spoken to the leaders, you have created your package, and then you're waiting for the call to come in. And you wait. And you wait longer. And after a while, the devil starts speaking to you. Maybe not. Maybe this is not what meant you're meant to do. And what do you do when you reach to the desert of desertion? <coughs> Books that you read and people that you meet can help you nudge forward. But beware of some people who have got good intention of coming and telling you, hey, don't worry, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Have you heard that one? <laughs> when you're down, I feel like killing those buggers. <laughs> because. The light at the end of the tunnel, because if life tunnel looks like this, of course you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but that's not how tunnels are in life. Tunnels in life looks like that. And you tell someone, hey, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. He's thinking, are you talking about? <laughs> so what do you do? Along the way comes a friend and just light up a little bit more to make the journey a bit more bearable. So here you go, my friend. Nothing I said. It's new, nothing. Whatever I said, it's nothing new. You have heard of it. You have heard of it, you have, you have read about it, but you know what's the difference? Knowing and doing are two very different things. Knowing but not doing is equal to not knowing. How many of you here do not know that you need to exercise three times a week? How many of you do not know every time you exercise, you need to exercise between 30 to 40 minutes to get some kind of cardiovascular benefits? You know that? How many of you do not know that you need to go easy with the carbohydrates, uh, high glycemic index carbohydrates, you need to go with leaner meat and more vegetables? How many of you do not know that? 
You all know that, but last night I know how you all ate. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. Gastronomically, we are a very advanced nation. We are the most obese nation in Asia, truly in the smell of Malaysia. We have done it, guys. And I believe five years from now, we will beat the Americans in the obesity game. We are coming for you. But here's the thing. You need to move from a human knowing to a human doing to eventually becoming the human being. You need to move from a human knowing to a human doing to a human being. If there's one person who taught me about this, it was my father. I joke about my father quite a bit. I do talk about my father being a watchman. My father was a watchman, was past tense. At the age of 51, my father stopped. What has he been doing? He's 84 years old right now. So what has he been doing for the past 33 years? The truth is, for the past 27 years, my father has been traveling around the world with his own money. You must understand, his highest pay ever in his life was 718 ringgit. My mother is illiterate, my mother can't read and write, my father was a watchman. So how is it that he traveled around? So at the age of 52, my father learned how to write calligraphy. He learned from a Muslim girl, 21 years old, beautiful girl, nothing was going on. <laughs> nothing. I think nothing was going on. <laughs> now he's a daughter of his fellow watchman, Pat Syed. He learned the calligraphy strokes because he wanted to write the Guru Granth Sahib, our our, our grant, our, our, our own Bible, which is 1,430 pages thick. He wanted to write it by hand, which is an art that's long lost. So we thought, okay, Dad has got a hobby, and we said, okay, good for you. You know, parents should have a hobby, or else your life would be hobbied by them. <laughs> <laughs> so they should be hobby, right? Have a hobby. So my father started, you know, after learning the stroke, he started writing cross leg, looking at the original script. It took him about 10 to 14 hours a day for 27 months to write the first one. Because if you wrongly write even a letter, you have to rewrite the whole page. Because it's blasphemy. So after 27 months, the book was written. I thought, OK, good. you know. And then some people from UK were traveling in Malaysia. They heard about my father. So they went down to the small town called Moab. And they saw the book. And they seemed they were very impressed by it. Two weeks later, I went to Moab to visit my father. I saw the house in a mess. Bags were being packed, clothes all over the place. I said, Pa, what's going on? He said, well, I'm going to UK, and you are not invited. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a man who did not even go back to India for 30 over years because he could not buy a ticket to see his mother. Packing his bag, going to UK, with my mother from Subang, Jaya, uh, from Subang Airport. They reached Heathrow. They were taken to South Hall, where the Punjabis are. <laughs> And the book was displayed. The seats all around from UK came down to see the book. And the diaspora all over Europe came down to see the book. About 30 years ago, my father collected close to 520,000 pounds in donation. Exchange rate was about seven, or 3.5 million at that particular time. About a month later, he came back and he said, Beta, Beta means uh, Beta, they really like my book. I said, wow, good. He said, I collected this amount of money. I'm like, oh, Papa, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you? I knew. <laughs> and then he said, uh, and I donated the money and wow. built a learning center in South Hall. I said, oh, good for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, where's the book? He said, I gave it to them. They liked it. So my father came back without the book that took him 27 months to write and broke, just like how he was. And then I said, Pa, why did you give the book? He said, don't worry, Beta, I write another one. Did you write the second one? Yes, he did. This time around, he wrote one of the biggest book in the world. Every page is amplified double the size. When you open up, the span is about five feet and the weight 84 kilos. The highest seat throne, Amritsar Golden Temple, invited my father to bring the book there. It's the Makafur seat. My father brought the book there, and they saw the book. They said, very good book. Would you want to put it in the main section, in the center of, of Amritsar? And my father said, sure. You can have it. In Britain, my father was given a piece of turban, six yards long, cost 23 Malaysian ringgit. May <laughs> not be of any value to you, but to a Sikh, it's one of the highest respect. It's the turban that we can on our head. He came back to Malaysia and said, beta, beta, see, you know, they gave me this turban. On that day, I started suspecting the mental condition of my father. <laughs> I think there's something wrong with this dude. <laughs> and he said, Beta, don't worry, Beta, I'll write another one. He did, but not in Malaysia. My father was invited to stay in Canada, 
he was given a house and chauffeur, a cook, in two different locations in Canada. Wrote one for the Sikhs there. After three years, came back to Malaysia only for a month. He was invited to stay in LA. My father was in LA for another three years. And I still remember one day he called me from LA. He said, Beta, how's everything? I said, I'm okay, Pa. Where are you? I said, I'm in the office. He said, business okay? I said, I'm okay, Pa. He said, do you need money? <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't worry, you'll lose the sun. going to make it, don't worry. <laughs> then I said, where are you? He said, I'm at Venice Beach. Wow. wow. I, said, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm here. You are not. <laughs> this is a good place for you young people. Yeah. He came back, he was in Australia for a bit, just to cut the story short, just before the lockdown, before the pandemic, my father just came back from Seattle, why he submitted the seventh one. In the entire Sikh history from the time the religion started in the 15th century, there's only one person during the time of the prophet who wrote four copies, my father wrote seven. I'm not telling you this because my father is a great man. He's just an ordinary man who did amazing things. I'm telling you this because my father has got the worst handwriting in the world. <laughs> my father's handwriting is so bad that a doctor's handwriting will look like art. <laughs> but if you look at every book that he's written, it's amazing. It, has, it looks as though it came out from a printing press. And when you ask him, but how is it that you write so nice? He said, better when I write, you know when I write? If I write the word, apple, A, P, P, L, A, when I write the A, after I write the A, when I write the P, I write it better than the P. The next P is better than the P that I just wrote. When I write the L better than the P, when I write the E better than the L, he's doing aggregation of marginal gains on a daily basis, consciously. So if you look at the seventh book, it came out like, so it came out from a printing press. Then I say, Pa, how do you write seven? You got angry. You say, you stupid, my father's favorite book. <laughs> you stupid, you don't have to write seven, thinking that you can write seven is arrogant. He said, I did not know whether I can write the first book. He said, forget the first book. He said, I did not know whether I can write the first page. He said, forget the first page. He said, I did not know whether I can write the first line to stop exactly where it's supposed to stop. He said, I did not know that part. He said, what I know is I can pick up the pen and write the first letter. It's not about the knowing. It's about the doing. The world is being shaped by people who did more rather than know more. I do not know whether Bharat is the best storyteller in the world. Probably someone out there can do better than Malaysia in Malaysia, but you know what? He's doing it and not us. I do not know whether Jega is the best designer for games, but you know what? He's doing it. I do not know all you people who are doing what you're doing. It's because you started, and the magic is in doing, not knowing. And you know what? The concept of fake it till you make it, a lot of people talk about it. And I think the third part, fake it till you make it, till you become it. You do it so often that you don't even know that you're pretending anymore. You become what you pretend to be. So, so if that's one person that actually gives me a lot in my life, he's my father, not the easiest man in the world, stubborn. While some people call it stubborn, it could also mean tenacity, holding on and not letting go. He's not a person who's gonna let go. By the way, that's my father. Wow. He's right now using a walker. Because of years of sitting down, degenerated his spine, and he's having difficulty walking. He's on a wheelchair, sometimes he also uses a walker. So he's sitting on an architecture table right now because he's writing on the eighth one. He's thinking that he's going to live until 120. I'm not trying to uh, discourage him to live until then. <laughs> but he's just writing. And this is a sample of a, of a book that's written. Aww. Yeah, it's open that way. So, you know, it's not about the knowing, it's about the doing. So I hope you go out there and do a bit more. Just to let you know, about uh, during the pandemic, I saw my father you know, exercising his legs and trying to do squats slowly. And I said, oh, what's going on? He said, you know, beta, maybe next year, the Penang Bridge, 21 kilo, maybe I also can do <laughs> <laughs> What do I say to him? I said, what shoe size do you wear? <laughs> My job is not to discourage him, because the day he stops, he's not going to make it. While I'm talking to you right now, the doors open. After two and a half years of pandemic, my father is not in Malaysia. The first person to get out of the country was my father on a wheelchair. He went back to India. Why? He said, hmm, ancestral land, I got one acre. I think I'm going to build a home. April 14, he flew off to India to build a house. My brother is an architect. He just sent my brother a picture. He said, this is how the house should be. He described my brother, did an illustration. 
And my brother said, what about the plans and you know the approval? He said, don't worry, all I need to do is put the first brick. So this slide deck is slightly different than the one I submitted because there's a video of my father in India. I thought it would be good for me to share. Uh, so here you go, this is a quick video. That's my father. Uh, so he's going, and that he, he called a tractor, he's sitting down there, he's supervising the workers. <laughs> and, and he's telling them what to do, and sometimes he's tired, and uh, sometimes he just lie down on the bed. That's, that's a place that he said he's there, watching people put up a double-story house. That's what he wants to build, and I don't know whether he can do it or not, but from his track record, I think he will. <laughs> so you know what? Don't worry about knowing too much. You just have to start. Here's my last question. Do you know how you run a 42.195 kilometer race? Take one step, that's too complex. Let me tell you how you do it. You register. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how you become a professional speaker? No, you just be a member of Malaysia as a professional speaker. Yeah, it's right. a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh,